I'm a social worker, and I want to say, uh, if you know anything about social work, you know that most social workers in the United States long ago sold out. Why? Because they needed a job, and because there wasn't enough money to really change things, so you did what you could with what you had. Okay? Now, we've just, I just want to say a couple of things as, a, as thoughts for us to consider. In the last year or so, we've seen some phenomenal changes that maybe will continue, which were Occupy. Nobody, I can tell you sincerely, nobody on the organized left anticipated Occupy. And I, I don't think many people in the world anticipated the various springs, whether they're right-wing springs or left-wing springs or some new phenomena around the world. We didn't anticipate these things, because I think, as a social worker, because we've been dumbed and numbed down as populations all over the world. The 1984 uh, theories of how you control people's ideology, and I think this is not a legal question or just a financial question, I think this is an ideological question issue in terms of how do you keep people not only afraid, but numb down so they won't act in any kind of way that threatens established power. While we were here, the news is full right now of uh, Vice President Biden's speech at NYU in British Village in New York. You got to listen to that speech. It is amazing what he's saying. One thing, he said Obama has a really big stick. He says a lot of other things that kind of uh, uh, Bidens that come out without his thinking. What he's really saying is that, uh, that Obama has done wonderful and we can't afford Romney and therefore let's go along with the program. I think what the questions that have been raised here really are about how do we not just pick the lesser evil? How do we in fact change the paradigm? I want one last thing. If you haven't read Naomi Klein's book, Shock Doctrine, please read it. At least read the first chapter. And what will you discover? The first chapter is about fear and psychological manipulation and control. A brilliant, I think, a brilliantly written book. An amazing book in many ways. But I think that's part of why we're beginning to see people all over the spectrum begin to get upset and doing something. So I applaud what's been said here today. And I hope we'll all do as much in every way we can. Actually, uh, Robert. Robert Lanza, I have a couple of uh, things about the issue of whether to have a resolution on the NBA. My view is that Congress didn't even bother to debate this issue. They just voted on it. And they voted on it in the dead of night. And the reason they voted on it in the dead of night is they didn't want to debate what they were doing. I think the reason to have a resolution is the debate itself to get the information that is in this room now out to the larger Tacoma Park community and out to the larger world so that they hear out there what we hear in here. Not just that I decide not to vote for Chris Van Hollen or not to vote for Barbara McCulson because of what they did or didn't do in Congress, but that more people hear through the debate on the resolution what is being discussed here in this room about the gravity of the situation about the loaded weapon, or my analogy, the room full of gasoline, and somebody has to walk in with a match, and that's all it takes. This is something that has the possibility of destroying the country, in my view. So the more people hear about it, and even if we get just a little bit outside to come apart with this information, maybe it's covered in Maryland press, or maybe it's covered in, you know, the Northeastern press, maybe it's covered elsewhere. That would be a good thing. And I think the resolution is a good vehicle for that rather than just us deciding to vote for this person or this other person because of particular actions they did or didn't take. The other thing that is of interest to me is that you can pick up a newspaper anywhere in the country, any time of day, open it up, and somebody is writing about the government having too much power. Whatever it is, property rights, gun rights, environmental legislation, oil and gas production, any issue you care to name, here's the paper, the government has too much rights. But now the government has the rights to, to indefinitely interpret Where is, the, what's the disconnect there? How do we breach that disconnect is something that I'm interested in. And I think that this debate is one way of doing that. 
to breach the disconnect between what everybody in the country says the government has too much power, but there is this rhinoceros sitting over there in the room that nobody wants to talk about. So those are those are kind of my two, my, my two points. Thank you. Urban. Yes. Well, I just my name is Stephen Waddy. I'm with the uh, ACLU of Maryland, and I definitely want to thank everybody for uh, the statements and appreciate you all um, and Thomas. Um, the uh, we, we did have a legislator in the state legislature exclusive resolution here. Um, he was a Republican. Um, it was based off of uh, the Tenth Amendment Center's um, resolution that they, they proposed for state legislators to introduce. And I think the Colorado or uh, Utah um, resolutions also were based along those libertarian, more conservative libertarian lines as opposed to the civil libertarian lines. And I was just wondering um, if you all could explain the differences, um, if, if you can. And, um, and what is this basically? So the Tenth Amendment Center, another group we're working closely with, sort of demonstrating this transpartisan alliance. That if there's anything in what you said, I push back on is that it's ideology. I almost think it's it's like it's deeper than that. You know, all, all American ideologies would agree. <laughs> um, but so yeah, the Tenth Amendment Center's resolution it is it it actually criminalizes compliance with the NDA, so that officials who do. Uh, <laughs> act pursuant to a, a federal order like state officials would be guilty of kidnapping. Um, so it's, it's got teeth that, that the, the, the criminal teeth that uh, many of the other ones don't. Um, you know, many people were concerned, one of the worst bills right now in the, in the Congress with respect to trying to repeal um, uh, the provisions of the NDA or modify them, um, I don't want to say it's one of the worst, because they're actually the worst ones. McCown's worse. Uh, Rigel's is worse. But uh, the Rigel? 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 Um, I tried to say it as little as possible. Yeah, and, <laughs> thanks. Well, well, Senator Feinstein, Democrat from California, heads the Intelligence Committee, has a horrible bill that would essentially restore due process only for citizens and create a second class in America of you know, visa holders, uh, long-term permanent residents, green card holders, who would suddenly, they would no longer have the right to trial. And when you create that distinction, you never know how far else it's going to go, right? So uh, the Tenth Amendment Centers is substantially stronger than many of the bills supported by Democrats. This is unfortunately a lens where this party does not fit. And, and that should be, quite frankly, an, an object of inspiration to all of us, I think. The idea that in this time of very vitriolic, deep partisan division, our nation could actually come together around something, to me, is very inspiring. It's a little disturbing that it takes an assault on a right as fundamentalist, the right to trial, to get us to finally discover some unity. Uh, but the Tenth Amendment um, Senator's resolution, I think, is one certainly worth looking very closely at. Uh, I think the criminal provisions may make some uncomfortable with this, uh, you know, the kind of question that Seth's raising in terms of the limits of local and state power. Um, you know, but just as a lawyer, I'd also say there's an adage in the law, and maybe this responds to some of your concerns as well, about uh, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. And the, the analogy to that, the separation of powers, is assertion is nine-tenths of the law. When people are, you know, present the ambiguity in the NDAA as some reason not to do anything about it, it forgets that when in the future some executive branch uses it, the assertion will control. No one ever authorized the NSA's warrantless uh, surveillance program for the first six years it was operational. The president just hashed it over the objections of an attorney general. John Ashcroft was the high watermark of attorneys general since then. Think about that. And that doesn't make you want to jump off of it. Right? And, and, and so you see I mean, that the, there are levers in our system of checks and balances for a reason. The genius of the founders for all of their faults was that they created a system where you would have contending, conflicting powers. Our branches of government and the federal, state, and local levers are supposed to work like crabs in a bucket to keep anyone from getting out. That was the point. That's why this federalism exists. That's why the separation of powers exists. The, 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 there was a trust that if a dominant uh, uh, political force came to co-op one of the branches, that the other ones would check it. So what happened in the NDAA? Congress was giving the executive branch powers it didn't even want. Right? I mean, the, 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 the levers are failing at the federal level. So, and that's why federalism exists. So that there's an ancillary system of checks. Right? It's supposed to be redundant checks and balances, and it's fallen to your court. 
you know, in the court of public opinion in Tacoma Park, Maryland, precisely because all of the other branches are marching in lockstep with them. Um, so I, I'd say look very closely at the TAC bill. It's, it's, it's worth supporting. Uh, and to the extent you can get Senator Raskin, perhaps, to introduce another bill that is more to the liking of the people in this room, I think that'd be a great debate. They're out of yeah. session. Like, they'll, they'll be back in. They'll, 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 they'll be, be back. But that's not, that's not this resolution. That's Right. 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 Yeah, yeah I, I would I would not dismiss it out of hand merely because it's sponsored by a Republican. I think it's worth, really worth looking closely at it. And, and again, Republicans have been, uh, to their credit, in the lead to restore the right to trial among elected office holders. There's no question that the Republican uh, populist establishment has had the loudest voice among elected office holders, and liberal and progressives are still paying catch up. And it might be because it was a Democratic president who signed the bill. Maybe that's a way of explaining it, but the fact that these values are so fundamental and transpartisan, I just think it, it's a really negative notion at the moment to consider partisanship as a reason to divide when we all have interests as Americans that, that, that should bring us together against a shared threat by our institutional establishment. What could be that that creates the opportunities? So whatever the motives are. There were other questions. Can just a question of Kansas. How does the law actually Work. I mean, how does the act work? I mean, who decides on who gets a civilian, who gets a military trial, and what's the procedure? So um, the way it finally came out was that the president, um, and it's again, it's very vague. The people who drafted it never bothered to take five minutes to think about how it would be implemented, which is one of the, you know, they literally set up a parallel system of justice without ever appearing no one ever called the National Institute for Military Justice to find out how they thought they would handle this. Nobody ever talked to the Pentagon about implementation while they were developing these provisions, nothing. So what the bill, what the law does say is that the president has waiver power. And, and that, originally, the president didn't have waiver power. That was one of the compromises put into it. So um, the administration put out um, fairly detailed um, Actually not really detailed implementing regs that basically say by these implementation regs we are establishing a once for all waiver. Um, so I mean it's it's literally not it takes the implementing regs are what three or four pages long. They're not they're not really very long at all <clears throat> for if you do this kind of legal or, or military stuff regularly. And it the what the I mean again this is it's really weird to me because whatever I may think of Buck McCann and Lindsay, right? the guys aren't stupid, but it, it just never seemed to, I really don't know what they thought would happen, that, that we would just shoot everybody on sight and then we'd never need to detain anyone, I, I don't know, because, um, so what the administration did in the implementing regs is basically create a system where anybody who's ever arrested for anything in the US is waived in advance and say, you know, if we want to put somebody in military custody, we will, because haha, we think that we have the right to do that if we want to, but um, we hereby establish that everybody will keep doing what they're doing up to now. So that's kind of an unsatisfying answer, but I mean, I just, I can't overemphasize, I sat on a panel with the head of the National Institute for Military Justice, who's a Republican from Oklahoma, and you know, so we sort of talked through, you take the underwear bomber, Right? Um, you know, here's a guy who tries to blow up a plane on Christmas Day over Detroit, is, is wrestled down by his fellow passengers on the plane. His, the first point of contact is, is actually the, um, is Homeland Security law enforcement <coughs> through the, the TSA and ICE. And they take the guy, you know, he's uh, badly burned um, in his genital area where the bomb was, and they take him to the hospital and they start interrogating him. Now. And then already this is bad enough because they um, have an intelligence exception where they didn't need to read the guy his Miranda rights for, oh, a day or two. Um, that's only established by executive um, regulation how long they go without reading him his Miranda rights. There's no law about that. But under, under the, as, as best one can understand the NDAA provisions, um, those um, DHS and then the FBI folks who were called in would have had to start looking around for some military detention facility that would take him. Now, Michigan has a ton of civilian prisons. It had, well, it now has a dying prison industry, but it has no, you would have had to go several hundred miles to find a military facility that could hold someone who had just tried to blow up an airplane. So what were, you know, what was the military supposed to do? Who was the, you know, what were you going to call the National Guard commandant on Christmas Day and say, hey, come and get this guy? Um, you know, I don't know if, 
folks know folks who have served with local National Guards and they're wonderful institutions, um, but they're not jailers. So this law imagined setting up, again, an entire parallel system of justice without putting in place any of the tools needed to do it. And God help us if some future administration actually decides to start implementing this law because the military, and this is the other thing, the military doesn't want to do this. And one of the things that um, officers will say when you talk to them about it is they'll say, if you put these people in our courts, our courts are for military officers are for who, who disobeyed military law. And if you put these guys, you know, these idiots who have bombs in their underwear, that is giving them a status as warriors that they don't deserve. And so the military actually says, we don't want to, you know, we want these bums to go in the criminal system with criminals. We don't actually want these people to be confused with sort of what we think of ourselves as warriors and so on. So uh, there's just, there's no answer to the question, which is very strange. The, the FBI director, Bob Lohmann, of the locus of his concern was precisely that ambiguity and how to deal with the situation on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, just to make that point, that the NDAA threatens not just your rights, but also national security, uh, as vouched for by the national security establishment. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, regs are fluid, right? The federal rulemaking process can change a set of regulations. And so the precise, you know, granularity mechanism through which the NDAA gets invoked can change from administration to administration. That doesn't require a statutory change. The statute is so vague that it can be read to permit more or less anything, which is exactly the problem.